Hello, hello. You're listening to Andy's Book Club. If you're new here, welcome. This is the show where we go through an exciting book chapter by chapter on a weekly schedule. Every week, I provide a recap of the chapter we're covering, and I add my commentary as we go along. If something requires more explanation, I might reserve some time at the end of the show and discuss it in more detail. So, whether you're studying for a test, writing an essay, or if you're like me, you're just super passionate about reading, this show is perfect for you. As a reminder, this show is available on YouTube, Spotify, and a whole bunch of other platforms. So, if you're watching this on YouTube, the links for all those other platforms are down below in the description. Or if you prefer, you can simply just search for Andy's Book Club directly on your favorite platform. But wherever you might be listening from, if you like the show, be sure to follow and subscribe. This show also has a Twitter page, so if I need to post visuals, I will do so on Twitter. So be sure to follow me there. Last week, we talked about the disastrous reign of King Aenys and how his indecisiveness and just general lack of awareness for making political decisions landed him in deep trouble, with rebellions cropping up left and right, and eventually resulting in his entire country being thrown into absolute chaos when religious extremist militant groups called the Poor Fellows and the Warrior Sons、uh, rose up against him. Just when the realm needed a king, a leader. At its most dire time, Aenys collapsed and died, leaving the throne now open and introducing even more power vacuums and uncertainties for the realm. It was at this moment that Queen Dowager Visenya acted more decisively than Aenys ever could. Upon Aenys's death, she mounted Vagar, flew across the narrow sea, and brought back her son Maegor so that he can inherit the Iron Throne. As Maegor returned, he was crowned the king. And given the iron crown of his father Aegon the Conqueror, in the Targaryen dynasty, the crown that a king chose often reflected the individual's personality. Iron is used to cast weapons. The Ironborn of the Iron Islands have a tradition called paying the iron price, which is when you gain an item from an opponent by killing him in combat. So, if you simply bought an item with money, that is called paying the gold price. So the Ironborn regarded paying the iron price as honorable and paying the gold price as dishonorable. So the fact that Maegor chose his father Aegon the Conqueror's iron crown、uh, shows that he really meant business. In contrast to Aenys, who wore a crown of gold. So the contrast here is very important. However, Maegor's ascension to the Iron Throne was not universally agreed upon. Far from it, in fact. Although I mentioned that it remained a debate as to whether the monarchy should pass to a female or to the closest living male,、uh, there was Prince Aegon, who is both male and a son of Aenys, who is the eldest son of Aegon the Conqueror. So, by the rules established by Aegon the Conqueror, the throne should no doubt pass to Prince Aegon as opposed to Maegor, who is the brother of Aenys, so the uncle to Prince Aegon. Uh, this is exactly what the then serving Grand Maester Gawain argued, and Maegor knew that his claim to the throne was not as strong as his nephew's, so he did not debate on this point, but simply replied that the throne should pass on to whoever had the strength to seize it. When Grand Maester Gawain objected further, Maegor just lopped off his head with his Valyrian steel sword Blackfire. Queen Elissa, the widow of the late King Aenys, sensed that the situation on Dragonstone was getting dicey. And fled to her father's castle on Driftmark. Recall that Elissa is a Valerian, and Valerians are based out of the island of Driftmark, which is not too far from Dragonstone.、Uh, Maegor, for now, had bigger issues than to deal with and try and hunt down Queen Elissa. His position as king was not entirely secure, since he knew that Prince Aegon would be a strong and alternative claimant to the throne. And also, there was a matter of the Faith militants who were still wreaking havoc all across the realm. Immediately after being crowned king, Maegor, along with his mother, Queen Dowager Visenya, both mounted their dragons and flew to King's Landing at once. The sight of the dragons sent the populace of King's Landing into a panic, and the people knew that a big war was now inevitable. The Warrior Sons, which is a faith militant group that had now taken over the walls of the city, barred the gates to prevent anyone from escaping. Within King's Landing, though, there were still knights and noblemen loyal to House Targaryen. And Visenya rallied them and devised a plan to defeat the Warrior Sons to take back full control of the city. The plan they came up with was simple: if the Warrior Sons were so devout, then they should be willing to make a bet. 
If the warrior sons can name seven champions, seven, as in the faith of the seven, seven is a magical number, uh, and go against Magor, who will also name himself and six other champions, uh, they will have a huge fight to the death, and whichever side wins means that they'll be blessed by the gods and that their side is the righteous side. So a giant trial by combat, essentially. Uh, and I won't bore you with the names of the people who fought, but the end result is that it came down to Magor and only two out of the seven warriors named by the warrior's sons, and everyone else had been killed at this point. So in the end, it became a two-on-one, but Magor still proved victorious. He killed the other two guys, but was injured so badly that for the next 27 days, he was essentially just in a coma. But he won, and it was now the warrior sons who were split. On one hand, it was clear that if the gods were real, they were not on their side because they just lost the trial by combat. On the other hand, there are other reasons for resisting the Iron Throne other than religious reasons. You'll find that in history, no rebellion is purely for one reason. There's always a whole bunch of other factors involved. So some people in the Warrior Sons wanted to fight on. But for now, the momentum had definitely shifted away from the Warrior Sons. Meanwhile, on Driftmark, Queen Elissa, no doubt just the slightest bit upset that Magor stole her son's throne, proclaimed her son, Prince Aegon, to be the new king. However, at this point, recall from last episode that Prince Aegon and his now sister wife, Reyna, were still trapped in this place called Craig Hall by the Poor Fellows, which is this other faith militant group. So the opportunity of escape came when the Poor Fellows started to march towards King's Landing in mass in an attempt to have their say on choosing the new king. So they definitely didn't approve of Magor or Prince Aegon. They wanted someone who, in their eyes, was not an abomination uh, born of committing incest. Prince Aegon and Reyna managed to escape to Casterly Rock, the home of the Lannisters, and was welcomed by Lord Lyman Lannister. And it was here on Casterly Rock that Lyman's wife, Lady Jocasta, discovered that Reyna was pregnant. Back to Magor, by the 28th day since the huge combat of the Seven, Alice Haraway returned from across the Narrow Sea. Recall last episode that Alice Haraway is the second wife of Magor, who he insisted on marrying, which created this rift between him and his brother, King Aenys. Now Alice was back, and she brought with her a woman named Tiana of the Tower. Tiana was a dancer and a courtesan which is a fancy term for kind of a high-class prostitute. Uh, and rumor has it that she was good at things like poison and dark magic. And, you know, a lot of it might be made up, but a lot of it is also probably true as well. Uh, upon Tiana's arrival, Queen Vizenya dismissed the maesters taking care of Magor and put Tiana in charge of taking care of Magor. The next day, Magor appeared alive and well on the balcony of the Red Keep. So I wonder what Tiana did that the Macers couldn't. Uh, recall the part that I just mentioned about dark magic. So maybe she worked some type of ritual or something. Or maybe she was just a really good doctor. Who knows? Uh, in any case, Magor was now back. And he ain't got no time for diplomacy. And he ain't gonna put up with people rebelling against him. The first thing that he did after waking up was to mount Balerion and flew to the biggest group of where the warrior sons were gathering and just burn everyone. So the warrior sons were now no longer a problem because Magor just burned them. Uh, and now there was still the issue, though, of the poor fellows flooding towards King's Landing, trying to choose a new king. Hmm, I wonder how Magor felt about that. Magor commanded all the lords that were still loyal to House Targaryen to disarm and disperse the poor fellows, by force if necessary. When the High Septon of Old Town heard about this, the gloves were now off. The High Septon ordered all those pious to rise up and throw out Magor and all those that the faith deemed abominations. After some resistance, Magor managed to defeat the poor fellows, with the help of his dragon of course, and upon his victorious return to King's Landing, he made a shocking announcement. King Magor decided that he would take Lady Tiana of the Tower as his third wife. Because why not? It's not like he was going to win back the faith of the Seven anyway, so he might as well, right? Uh, Magor held a wedding on top of the Hill of Rainies, the same place where he had burned to death the warrior sons not too long ago. 
It was said that Magor also executed about a dozen septons before he found one that was willing to officiate the wedding. In attendance to the wedding was also Queen Alyssa, along with her two sons, Viserys and Jaharis, and her daughter, Alisan. Queen Dowager Visenya had flew to Driftmark on top of Vagar and persuaded Queen Alyssa to come to the wedding and acknowledge Magor as the true king. Recall that Alyssa's other children, Princess Reyna and Prince Aegon, were still at Castle Rock under the care of the Lannisters. And you have to kind of feel bad for Prince Aegon here. All his life he had been considered heir presumptive, and now his uncle had usurped his throne, and more and more people are abandoning uh, Prince Aegon and pledging their allegiance to Magor every day. People began to call Aegon his father's son, which is a roundabout way of insulting him since his father was of course King Aenys, uh, who was considered to be weak and indecisive. Many people also called Aegon by a name that stings a lot less subtly. Uh, they called him Aegon the Uncrowned. It also didn't help that Aegon had not claimed a dragon yet of his own, whereas Magor claimed his father, Aegon the Conqueror's dragon, Blarion the Black Dread. Lord Lyman Lannister, for what is worth, did not heed the calls of Magor to return Aegon and Reyna back to King's Landing, knowing that it would certainly be a death sentence. Um, but Lyman did not fully endorse Aegon's claim to the throne either. So Lyman was trying to play both sides and it was a precarious situation for everybody for sure. It was under these circumstances that Reyna gave birth to twin daughters named Arya and Riella. And of course, uh, the two children were born from an incestuous sibling marriage, so the faith was quick to denounce the children as abominations. For what is worth, Aegon the Uncrowned had a bit more determination than his father. Aegon was trying to become crowned and vowed to fight his uncle Magor for the throne. In 43 AC, the conflict between the crown and the faith was still far from resolved. Although King's Landing was now firmly in the grasp of Magor, the poor fellows and the warrior sons had regrouped and were wreaking havoc on the countryside. King Magor and Dowager Queen Visenya rallied supporters to take the fight to the faith and put down the rebellions once and for all. They both assembled an army and mounted their dragons and arrived at Old Town ready for a fight. It was only when the Targaryen host arrived at Old Town did they realize that the gates were open and the defenses unmanned. Apparently, the High Septon, who's the spiritual leader of the faith and the faith militants by extension, had died. The timing of his death did seem awfully convenient for the Targaryens. If he had not died, there surely would have been a huge battle causing massive devastation and Old Town might have been completely destroyed by Dragonflame. So it does seem plausible, even likely, that he was murdered by someone who wanted to avoid a full-on conflict where the other side had two giant dragons. Uh, whatever the case is, we'll never know. But the man that they named the new High Septon was named Septon Pater, who was 90 years old by the time. And he was old and he was blind and feeble and he was more than happy to just anoint Magor as king. So a huge war was averted. The warrior sons were commanded to disarm and dissolve, and as punishment, Magor gave them the choice of joining the Night's Watch at the Wall or die as a martyr. For those of you who watched Game of Thrones the show or read Game of Thrones the book, uh, you would be familiar with the practice of taking the black, which is joining the Night's Watch on the Wall. About a quarter of the warrior sons chose death, while the rest chose the Night's Watch. Magor spent some time at Old Town, and while there he rekindled his relationship with his first wife, Cerise. Recall that Cerise is from House Hightower, which is the ruling family of Old Town, uh, and she had returned to Old Town when Magor essentially abandoned her and decided to marry Alice Haraway. Magor was still technically married to her this whole time, hence the polygamy and why the Faith was so mad at him. Uh, so now Magor had three queens, Cerise, Alice, and Tiana. In the latter half of 43 AC, Aegon the Uncrowned decided that it was time to launch his campaign to take back the throne from Magor. With Magor still in Old Town, Aegon and Reyna snuck into King's Landing so that Aegon can claim his father's dragon, Quicksilver. They were aided by certain members of Magor's court who had become wary of the king's cruelties. Aegon was successful in his endeavor and flew out of King's Landing on the back of Quicksilver. Now in possession of his very own dragon, 
Aegon the Uncrowned finally has a shot at winning back the throne that he believed was rightfully his. Aegon assembled an army made up of mostly the river lords and the knights from the Westerlands. Before he could hope to get anyone else to support him, Aegon needed to demonstrate that he could win. The battle came just south of the Gazai, and for the first time since the Doom of Valeria, Dragon went against Dragon. Aegon on top of Quicksilver went up against Magor on Balerion. This is somewhat of an unfair fight though. Quicksilver was only a quarter of the size of Balerion. Balerion's jaws closed around the neck of Quicksilver and ripped his head off with one swift motion. Quicksilver plummeted to the earth, taking Aegon with it. When the day was done, Aegon the Uncrowned had perished, along with 2,000 of his men and many notable lords who fought with him. Reyna, for whatever reason, had not joined the battle that day and stayed behind. Thus, she survived. When news of her husband's death reached Reyna, she did not cry. She solemnly stated that she had no time for tears and at once fled west with her daughters to a place called Fair Isle, which is an island off the west coast of Westeros. So, as far as she can get away from King's Landing as possible. By 44 AC, Magor had now successfully stabilized the situation. The Faith Militants have now largely been put down and there were no more challengers to his throne after the death of Aegon the Uncrowned. But by now, Magor had gained a reputation. People called him Magor the Cruel, due to his many years of nonchalantly killing everyone who opposed him. Also, the crime of kinslaying, i.e. killing a member of your own family, is a huge no-no in the traditions of Westeros. Kinslaying, killing his own nephew, even though it was a political fight for the throne, is regarded as one of the most dishonorable acts that someone can do. So, uh, people really didn't like Magor, but of course now everyone was too scared of him to speak up. There was also the issue of succession. Despite having three wives, Magor had yet to produce an heir. Rumor has it that he was cursed, due to all the bad things that he had done. It was then a great triumphant moment when Queen Alice announced that she was pregnant. But during the third month of her pregnancy, she miscarried and the fetus that came out of her was deformed and misshapen, a monstrous thing that did not look human. So this further added fuel to the rumor that Magor was somehow cursed. It was then revealed that Alice, fearing that she would end up old, childless, and bitter like Ceres Hightower, Magor's first wife, she had snuck up to 20 different men into her bedroom for the past year or so in order so that she could uh, conceive a child for Magor and pass it off as his. However, Tiana, who was known to be the master of dark magic and whispers, found out about all of this and told Magor. Magor was of course livid when this was revealed that Alice had cheated on him, with so many different men, he rounded up all the men on the list, a list that Tiana conveniently provided him, and also Alice's family, including her father, who was the then hand of the king, and executed them all. The worst death, of course, was reserved for Alice herself, who was tortured to death and her body dismembered and left to rot on spikes afterward. Magor also took an effort to purge all of House Haraway, at this point, House Harrowway was in charge of Harrenhal, and it was said that Harrenhal is cursed because every house that uh, became in charge of it met a violent end. But anyways, executing one of his queens and purging an entire house, however, definitely did not do any favors for Magor in terms of reputation. After all these bloody affairs at Harrenhal, Magor returned to King's Landing and learned that his mother, Queen Dowager Visenya, had died. Queen Elissa, the widow of King Aenys, took the opportunity to escape Dragonstone along with her children in the chaos and confusion that followed Visenya's death. They even managed to steal her Valerian steel sword, Dark Sister, as she fled. Magor, upon hearing about Queen Alyssa's escape, commanded that her son Viserys, who was serving as his squire and in reality a hostage, uh, to be arrested and questioned as to where his mother, Alyssa, had fled. Viserys did not know where his mother had gone, however, so no amount of torture would work because he can't just reveal something that he doesn't know. But Magor still threatened to execute Viserys if Queen Alyssa did not turn up. Viserys was questioned for nine days and died as a result of torture and whatever dark magic Tiana had applied to him. 
yet another atrocity to add to Megor's growing list. Viserys was only 15 years old when he died, and this is also kinslaying. Remember that he's also Megor's nephew. So in a few short years, he's executed his former queen Alice and her entire family, killed one nephew in combat, and tortured another nephew to death. Yikes. In 45 AC, Megor finally completed the construction of the Red Keep. During the construction, he had ordered all types of secret passages to be built. Upon the completion, he threw a feast for all the workmen who worked on the construction and then executed them all so that they can't leak the secrets of where the secret passages are. Yeah, Megor is really hardcore. After the completion of the Red Keep, Queen Cerise fell ill and died. This was the official story anyways. The alternative rumor was that Cerise had made some disparaging comments about Megor which enraged him and Megor ordered for her tongue to be cut out, but the knife slipped and slashed open her throat instead. Whatever the case is, regardless, she died childless and Megor went from having three queens to now just one. By 47 AC, Megor was still without an heir and he committed to finding another wife. He decided that Reyna, his niece, and the widow of Aegon the Uncrowned would make the perfect wife for him. Her fertility was proven since she had already given birth to twin daughters Arya and Riella, and marrying her would reunite the two competing claims to the throne since it would reunite his line with Aenys' line. Maegor sent a summons to Fair Isle to summon Reyna to King's Landing for the marriage. Reyna thought about escaping, however, dragons were hard to hide, and she had her dragon, Dreamfire. More importantly, going up against Megor would endanger the lives of her daughters, so Reyna chose to oblige with the summons. To make extra sure that he would eventually be able to get an heir, Megor also forced two other women to marry him, Lady Jenny of House Westerling and Lady Eleanor of House Castain. The two women, along with Reyna, became known as the Black Brides, since they were all widows. And of course, these weren't happy marriages since they were all forced to marry Megor. But for now, Princess Arya, the daughter of Reyna and Aegon the Uncrowned, was named as a temporary placeholder heir until such time that Megor can have a son. Half a year after the wedding of the Black Brides, Queen Jenny announced that she was with child. However, the happiness turned sour during the third month of her pregnancy, uh, Jenny miscarried and gave birth to a fetus that was just as deformed and monstrous as the fetus born by Queen Alice. Again, the Megor being cursed thing seems to be playing out again. To compound Megor's troubles, Queen Jenny died in childbirth. So there goes one of the Black Brides already. Not a good look at all for Megor. So now the rumors were really flying that Megor was cursed. Megor came to the conclusion that it was Queen Tiana, the sorceress known for her dark magic, that cursed Alice and Jenny, which led to both of them giving birth to monsters and leading to both of their deaths. Uh, whether this accusation was true or not is hard to say. Tiana was indeed hated for number one being a foreigner, recall that Alice had brought her over from Essos originally, uh, and two, practicing unknown magic and using it to torture people on behalf of Megor's orders. And granted, she did have an incentive to curse or poison Megor's other wives because I'm sure she wanted to be the one to give birth to what would be Megor's first child so that her kid would be the first in line for the throne. Uh, regardless, it seems like Megor and Tiana had a falling out and Megor ordered Tiana to be arrested and sent to the dungeons. Under duress, Tiana did confess to cursing Alice and Jenny and promised that Eleanor's child would also be monstrous and misshapen. Megor was so enraged by this that he drew Blackfire and personally cut out Tiana's heart. So that ended the life of Tiana of the Tower. Tiana, though, would have the last laugh, since indeed not too long after her death, Queen Eleanor gave birth to a stillborn fetus. The fetus was monstrous and misshapen. It had no eyes and rudimentary wings, kind of like a mixture between a human and a dragon. In 48 AC, the rumors that Megor was cursed had hit a fever pitch. His followers began to melt away and it seemed like Megor had lost the right to rule in the eyes of the gods. In Storm's End, Lord Rogar Baratheon proclaimed Prince Jaharis, the son of King Aenys and Queen Alyssa, to be the new king of Westeros. 
Queen Alyssa, after escaping Magor's grasp after the death of Queen Dowager Vizenya, had turned up at Storm's End and given Vizenya's sword, Dark Sister, to Jaharis and held him as the new king. Jaharis was only 14 years old at the time, but he rode a great bronze colored dragon named Vermithor. His sister, Princess Alizan, also had her own dragon, Silverwing. When word of Jaharis' rebellion reached King's Landing, Queen Reyna, who we recall is Jaharis and Alisan's older sister, mounted Dreamfire and escaped King's Landing to join her brother. Magor may be powerful with his dragon Balerion, but Jaharis now had three dragons on his side. After word of Jaharis' rebellion spread more, lords of the realm abandoned Magor in droves. Magor called a meeting of those who remained loyal to him to discuss a plan of attack. In retrospect, this was a bad idea. When the lords saw how few of them remained who were still loyal to Magor, they panicked. Lord Hayford suggested to Magor that he should abdicate the throne and take the black to join the Night's Watch. This suggestion offended Magor so much that he ordered Hayford to be beheaded on the spot and continue the rest of the discussion with Hayford's head mounted on a spike. Let's just say that this was not very helpful in terms of winning over any more followers. The discussion went late into the night, and the lords had already retired, leaving Magor brooding on the Iron Throne alone. The next day, Magor was discovered dead on the Iron Throne. Some say he took his own life, and some say that the Iron Throne itself rejected him and impaled him somehow. Uh, some say that the King's Guard, or one of the many, many people that Magor had pissed off over the years, had finally had enough and took a stab at him and succeeded. We'll never know for sure. In any case, the reign of Magor lasted for 6 years and 66 days, and in history he would be known as Magor the Cruel, for obvious reasons. He died childless, so the Iron Throne passed from him to Jaehaerys. Alright, I think that's a good spot to end the show for this week. Next week, we'll be discussing the reign of King Jaehaerys, who inherited the Iron Throne at the tender age of 14, and will he be a better ruler than his uncle Magor? The realm holds his breath. Anyways, hope you enjoyed this week's episode, and that's it for now. Thank you.